The mighty canine creature was a wonder to behold on the battlefield. Commanding the vanguard with the authority only a celestial could muster, he was the first in to raise steel against our foes. Welcome to Monster of the Week! This week we are going to be talking about a monster that was a staple for me back in 3rd edition, the Hound Archon. The Hound Archon can be found in both 3rd and 4th editions of the game, just in your basic monster manual. Now I understand that wizards had to make some cuts for the new edition of the monster manual, but these guys are truly useful creatures and they just look really awesome too. So today we'll cover what they are, how they fight, some options you can use to make them truly unique, and of course some ways you can use them in your game. So in case the name didn't already give it away, Hound Archons are celestial humanoid creatures with the head of a dog. They're extremely bulky and they're built for combat. They can be found in all different kinds of places and roles, but are most often found either serving some kind of deity or serving in a celestial army, usually as a commanding officer type. However, one thing is always true. They seek to defend the weak and annihilate evil, no matter what form it presents itself in. These canine champions are able combatants, combining raw martial strength with a touch of the divine. They fight much like you'd expect a paladin to. So let's take a look at exactly what they can do. As a retired member of the Archon subtype from 3rd and 4th edition, the Hound Archon has an ability called Menace. This ability functions much like the Paladin's Turn ability in 5th edition, however it affects a 20 foot radius around the creature. The Hound Archon doesn't even need to trigger this ability. Whenever it enters combat or just gets angry, any hostile creature within that 20 foot radius has to make a will save. Anyone that fails that will save is subject to the fear effect, with the target of the fear of course being the Hound Archon. Like most fear based abilities, if the subject succeeds on the will save, it doesn't need to make another one for at least 24 hours, but this is still a really crazy ability considering that the Hound Archon doesn't actually have to do anything to make this happen. It doesn't require the use of an action, it's just an aura that is around it at all times. And this ability could potentially sway the fight in favor of the Hound Archon if you get it off right at the beginning of battle. Being an Archon also grants this creature the ability to cast Teleport, with the added restriction that it can only take itself and no other creatures. This might not seem like a huge deal, but being able to teleport into and out of combat can be really useful, especially if the Hound Archon needs to make a quick getaway. In addition to these supplementary spells and abilities, the Hound Archon is also just a good fighter. It has two natural attacks in the form of a slam and of course a bite. They're also very proud of their ability to swing that great sword, so no matter what the circumstance, expect an all out battle when the Hound Archon is involved. Unlike a lot of creatures that use weapons, the Hound Archon's natural attacks are far from a last resort. They can be just as potent as a swing from a great sword in some situations, so depending on the circumstance, the Hound Archon may choose to keep its blade sheathed. Now it should come as no surprise that there are some differences between the 3rd and 4th edition Hound Archons. Thematically, they're pretty much identical, but in 4th edition they have one ability that I feel fits their character and design perfectly. In 4th edition, the Hound Archon has an ability called Honor and Duty. Basically what it does is once per combat, as a reaction, they can swap places with one of their allies who is about to take an attack. They take the full damage of the attack, but they take it in place of the ally who they swapped places with. To me, this perfectly sums up the Hound Archon as a capable warrior who's able to take a hit and is willing to sacrifice himself for those he's loyal to. Like any good guard dog, he'll defend his master, or in this case, his companions. It also helps that the Hound Archon has resistances to a lot of damage types and even immunity to some like electricity. So in most cases, the Hound Archon is going to be happy to step in and take the hit for one of its less defensive allies. Plus, if you're using the Hound Archon in the role of an ally, it really sets up the potential for some very dramatic moments. More on that later. The very last ability I want to touch on is almost never going to be used in combat, but it has so many role playing and plot driven uses that I can't leave it out. The Hound Archon has the ability to shape change into any small, medium, or large form that is of canine origin. The book is extremely vague on this and basically just leaves it up to you as the DM to decide what is canine, but essentially anything that is a dog or a wolf is totally fine. The Archon of course loses the ability to swing his sword and slam in this state, but he does gain the natural attacks of whatever form it is he assumes, and he gains the scent ability which grants advantage for tracking targets. This ability is so interesting to me because it's very clear it was put in the game for purely non-combat roles and purposes. 
but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now you should have an understanding of what the Hound Archon is capable of in combat, so let's go over some plot devices and potential roles that these guys are well suited for. One of the things that makes this creature so great is that it's a relatively low CR, so if you want Celestials involved in your game but you're not playing at super high level, these guys are an excellent fit. Like just about every other Celestial in the book, Hound Archons can make a great ally or guardian. If you plan on having your players set off in some kind of adventure ordained by the gods, a Hound Archon can be the perfect tool to get them on that path. Perhaps after fighting alongside him in battle, the Hound Archon sees the tenacity of the players and invites them on his quest, promising them a chance for glory and service to whatever deity he serves. And of course, treasure along the way. The Hound Archon is also a prime candidate for the role of the Martyr. In storytelling, a plot device that I've used myself many times is to have the players start out allied with a more powerful and experienced character. This can be a big help to newer players especially, and it gives you, as the DM, a tool to kind of bail them out of trouble a couple times if they get in over their heads without really realizing what they're doing. It should never get to the point where they rely on this character, but if they do, it will just make the martyrdom of the Hound Archon that much more impactful. When the time comes, maybe the party has an encounter with the big bad evil guy of the first arc of your adventure. It should become pretty clear to them as the fight goes on that they're outmatched by this guy, but having that villain kill the party's ally, in this case the Hound Archon, will really solidify that message. This is a character who they know is more powerful and they know is more experienced than everyone else in the party, and if he's killed by this guy, then that means the guy who killed him must be that much more powerful. Perhaps the villain goes in for a devastating attack against one of the party members. The Hound Archon sees this, and knowing that that party member will not survive this attack, loyal to his companions, he switches places with them and takes the full brunt of it on himself. It can create a really dramatic moment where the party sees this companion who they've been with for the past weeks in game, literally sacrificing himself for their benefit right before their eyes, without even a second thought. And I don't think that's outside of what a Hound Archon would do in that situation either. It plays perfectly to their roles as guardians and loyal companions. If you really want to make your players hate the villain, have him just leave after this. A lot of players would probably be willing to fight the villain to the death after this, because they feel that's what their character might do in this situation. Especially if you've got some paladins or noble warriors in the group. But if the villain kills their buddy, and then just decides the rest of the party isn't even worth his time, maybe he was just there to kill the Hound Archon, then you won't even have to try to hook them into going after this guy. They're gonna hate him that much more. Not only have they killed one of their companions, they've also been disrespected by him. Despite whatever hangs in the balance in the overall story of your adventure, whether it be the town they're from, the entire kingdom, or even the world, having a personal vendetta like that against the villain is going to make the story that much more intense, and you won't have to try to keep them driven to going after him. They will want to kill that villain no matter what. On the flip side of this, you could totally use a Hound Archon as an opponent too, especially if your party is of the sort in the, uh, gray area so to speak, it would make perfect sense for a Hound Archon to want to engage them in combat. If they actually kill the Hound Archon, this opens up a world of possibility to you as a DM. Now maybe they've incurred the wrath of whatever deity that Hound Archon served, which gives you an excuse to throw more Celestials at them, and that could just be a whole campaign in and of itself. That said though, it's totally reasonable to just have them show up as a random encounter and leave it at that. Say you have a party that's not necessarily on the grey area or even evil side of things and you want to use a Hound Archon as an encounter, you could also roleplay the experience as just a misunderstanding. Maybe the Hound Archon receives some bad information and thinks the players are someone that they aren't, or possibly he walked into a situation and doesn't fully understand what's going on. Whatever the reasoning, this gives the players an opportunity to talk themselves out of the situation, and if it does come to combat and they force the Hound Archon into a point where he yields, then they can try to explain themselves and maybe make a new friend. Players, being human beings, are often unpredictable though, so who knows how this would actually pan out, but the point is that there's a million different ways this could go and you're giving them options in an interesting encounter. One other plot device that I think is just fantastic is using the Hound Archon's shape change ability to learn more about the player characters. Just picture this. The party is traveling down a dirt road, it's pouring rain and they spot a scruffy looking dog taking shelter underneath a nearby fallen tree. There are plenty of things that could happen here, but what the party doesn't know is that scruffy looking mud over there is actually a celestial being in disguise trying to get a read on the party. Maybe the Archon is seeking allies to fight against some evil force, or maybe it simply just wants to get to know more about the PCs for a different reason, but ultimately, the Archon is going in disguise to get a true understanding of what these players are like. 
If the party ends up taking the dog with them, you could have the Hound Archon stay disguised for weeks or months even, only to reveal its true nature at the most opportune moment. If you were waiting for the opportune moment, that was it. So one last thing I want to talk about here, because it's simply too awesome not to talk about, is the third edition option for a higher level Hound Archon called the Hound Archon Champion. As I said previously, the regular Hound Archon is somewhat low level, which is ideal for some games, but if you want a higher level Hound Archon, the Hound Archon Champion is of CR 17. Literally what they did to make it this powerful is they just took the base creature, the Hound Archon, and they gave it 11 levels in Paladin. I'll be sure to put the Hound Archon Champion as a separate creature under the Hound Archon in the stat block posted in the description below, just so that way you don't have to build it from the ground up by adding in all those Paladin levels yourself. But I just thought this was a really cool idea, and if you like these creatures and you're DMing for a higher level party, this is a great way to add them into your game. I also just love the idea of this grizzled old Hound Archon character who's battled across the plains over a lifetime, fighting for the forces of justice and good. It could make for a really awesome characters that your PCs would have a chance to interact with. Aside from their Hound Archon traits though, the only difference between a level 11 Paladin and the Hound Archon Champion is their choice in Mount. In 5th edition, Paladins get the Find Steed spell, which gives them access to a fiendish or celestial mount that they can summon pretty much whenever they want. The Hound Archons get a much more unique choice. According to the book, throughout the course of their countless adventures and battles, many Hound Archons come to befriend Bronze Dragons. And these Bronze Dragons will often come to serve as a mount for the Hound Archon. The source book even goes on to say that this relationship goes beyond the bond regularly shared by a Paladin and its mount and that these two creatures are predisposed to being natural allies and friends, as can be expected of two powerful servants of cosmic justice. Tell me that is not one of the most badass things you've ever heard. So that about sums up the Hound Archon, and if you plan on using these heavenly hounds in one of your games, please tell me about it in the comments below. And if you like what I do here, please feel free to subscribe, I have at least one new video every week, and I honestly really appreciate all the support that I get from you guys. Seriously, I can't thank you enough on that. Speaking of which, it's time to talk about the first ever giveaway I'm going to do on the channel. For those of you who saw my update video last week, you probably had an idea this was coming, but for everyone else, here's the deal. Just as my way of saying thank you to all the awesome community members here, I'm going to be giving away one of the source books that's focused on monsters. The winner of the draw will have their choice between either Volo's Guide to Monsters, or The Tome of Beasts, which is published by Cobalt Press. I own both of these books, and honestly, they're fantastic. But I know some people might have one or the other, so ultimately, if you win, you get to pick whichever one you want. So how do I enter, you're probably wondering. Well, as of right now, there's going to be a tweet up on my Twitter profile with a link to this video and announcing the giveaway. All you have to do is make sure you're subscribed to the channel here on YouTube, then head over to my Twitter page, you can find the link in the description if you don't already know it, and then just retweet the giveaway post. Feel free to add a comment to your retweet telling me what kind of monsters you'd like to see next, or just saying something snarky, that's fine too. As long as you retweet that post, you are officially entered. I'll be doing the draw on the 28th of April, so if you do decide to enter, good luck. And as always, thank you so much for watching, may all your sessions run smoothly, and I'll see you next time.